to stand with you. GM, GM, Azadi, women, life, freedom. Demanding those basic human rights and they're showing no signs of slowing Rough down treatment life. and risking death at the hands of the Iranian. Ah, so Protesting not only religious restrictions, but, Iranian but economic does. hardship. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Most of us have probably heard of a news that has been presented sensationally in the last few days. The report was speaking about 15,000 people in the presence of uh, Iran would be executed or have been executed. The news went viral, but very soon it, it was, I mean, taken off from the news and it was very clearly explained that nothing of that sort happens. But the kind of people who responded to this news included Justin Trudeau, the, the Premier of Canada, and several other activists all across the world. Even BBC has reported first this report, and then came out with an explanation that, no, that's not a correct news. Time Magazine has a full-fledged story about how this report has been in circulation. Just imagine, 15,000 people are now in the presence of the Iranian authority. The student movement, the revolution that's going on there against the compulsory hijab query that has gone into new dimension. It's almost two months that people have been on the streets. More than 300 people have been shot dead or killed in the process. And people are not scared. They are not stopping anything. They are just continuing the struggle, demanding to uh, get their wish that they can wear their dress the way they want. Very simple, that's no compulsory hijab for them. They have been shooting, there have been police atrocities, there have been beatings of people and people are taken into prison. And I mean, very recently, more than five or six people have been executed. More than 30 people are already, I mean, officially executed who are part of the struggle. It was in this background came this news that the Iranian parliament has decided to execute 15,000 people. But what exactly was the reality? The reality was the Iranian authorities are scared. They cannot handle the situation. It's like a wildfire. It's going all across Iran. And from every home, from every educational institute, people are coming out, defying the strict laws, insisting on their rights. They come out on the streets, take off their hijab, or they cut their hair and to clearly defy the orders of the authority. And of the 15,300 people who are now in jail, how many of them would be executed or would serve a long-term prison? Nobody knows. The report came on the backdrop of a parliamentary discussion wherein a huge majority members of the parliament voted giving authority to the government to give harshest possible punishment to the participants of the struggle. The struggle it is not just began from the incident that happened two months back. It's not Maisha Amini's 
uh, I mean, that's the only reason for the struggle. There have been a struggle which is going on for quite some time. This particular incident has given a new momentum for the whole struggle. But could the, this be stopped? With this new decision of the parliament giving total authority to the uh, government to give harshest possible punishments to all the prisoners was the backdrop when this rumor came around. Who was behind this rumor? And what is the actual impact of this rumor? That's what we have to see at this moment. Because three days back when the report was all around the world that 15,000 people will be executed in one night, there was shock. The whole world was shivering with shock because nobody has seen such a thing in the recent past. After Holocaust, perhaps this would have been the biggest collective execution of people. But why did such a rumor spread so fast? Who was behind it? Some of the reports point out that the reports were coming actually from Iran itself. And what could be the intention? One of the doubts expressed by the people who are seriously concerned about the situation in Iran goes as follows. You heard this news that 15,000 people would be executed who were part of this struggle against the authorities. There was shock. That's the biggest possible shock that people could get. But the next day, when five people were executed, many people felt relieved of only five people. Tomorrow, if a larger number of people are executed, maybe 300, 400, still many people would feel relieved that 15,000 people were not killed. The shock is taken off. The shock is absorbed into. This is one of the classical ways of handling big offenses. You give an impression that a huge avalanche of punishment is coming and the world was prepared for that and the shock is given and the waves are settling down and then comes a major event which would be seen with lesser importance. We have a lot of examples in history, even during Holocaust, even during the mass murders that happened in many other parts of the world, this kind of a technique was used by the authorities and that has been recorded also. We can go to two similar examples, one from Iran and one from Indonesia. In Iran, after the revolution, the Islamic revolution in 1979, you all know that the Islamic revolution was initiated not by the Muslim radicals. It was initiated by those people who were actively engaged in the struggle against the authorities, against the monarchy, and against the policies. And it was mainly a student movement, a collective movement of the left uh, organizations, and a lot of people who were liberals. It's a collective movement of the liberals and the left that fought against the authority, monarchical authority and the absolute totalitarian rule of the, uh, the, the Shah government was practically hijacked by the Islamic radicals. Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, who became the supreme commander of the Iranian government, was not even in Iran at that time. He was in Paris. He was in a self-imposed exile in Paris, guiding, in a way, the struggle. And he landed back in Tehran immediately after the overthrow of the Shah government. Shah has left the country, he was very old, and his regime was collapsing and he left. And immediately after that, when Ayatollah Rahola Khomeini came, suddenly there was an euphoria 
and there was a huge support that was shown. And the government, which was pro-Islamic revolution, took over the power, almost like a coup, and the, all other elements, the left elements, the liberal elements, and all were kept off, but they all supported the new regime, hoping that a joint government is coming and there'll be new fresh elections and a new democratic way of life would be coming to Iran. Nothing of that sort happened. Instead, the, the new government took an Islamic line very clearly. And the first election was almost giving an impression that it would be an open society where perhaps there would be some predominance to the Islamic culture, but things went totally different once the authority was established and Ayatollah Ruhullah Khomeini was established as the supreme commander above the parliament. First time in this century we have seen a new theocratic government establishing in the fullest form of it. You have to remember that the other Muslim countries in the world, there is no full theocracy anywhere. Saudi Arabia, there is a monarchy which has Islamic rules. And most of these United Arab Emirates countries, they're all monarchies. Whereas in Iran, what they established was a constitutional theocracy. A rule was established based on Quran, Quranic laws, and above the whole thing, a cleric a religious leader was installed as a, a supreme authority and every single law passed in the parliament, every single legislation that was passed in the parliament should be accepted by him. Which would mean that the supreme religious authority has absolute power above even the parliament. So what was they fighting for? They have been fighting for a democratic system against a monarchy which was an almost an absolute monarchy. And they got instead a kind of a theocracy, a full form of modern theocracy with an elected government under the theocratic leader who can dismiss the government, who can stop any law and who would be in absolute control. And one of the first laws that they established was the compulsory imposition of hijab. No woman was allowed after the establishment of that law to go out without covering the head properly and the whole body properly. That should be a loose dress only that they should wear. Once this law was established, that was the beginning. There was unhappiness from the liberals and the left, left groups. There was a kind of disbelief that it was going in a different direction than they thought. And there was some kind of dissent slowly catching up. Then came a sudden news that the left groups, as well as the liberals, were conspiring to overthrow the government. A coup d'etat was planned. And before the coup was actually happening, they were all arrested. No one knows I mean, whether there was a, an attempt of a coup, if there was an effort to overthrow the government, but that was the official version. And all the people who were in the leadership of the Today Party, which was the Communist Party there, which was partially responsible for the revolution, arrested. But not only them, the liberals, the writers, the critics, Everybody who could influence the decisions of the government were all arrested. Then there was there were reports that the coup would be there would be a trial in the court, and all those people who were involved in the, the coup attempt would be punished, but others will be released. This is a precautionary measure that all of them were arrested. Nearly eight to nine thousand people were arrested in a few hours, they were all in prison. Then came a rumor like what came some days back. It was decided to execute 
all the leaders of the liberals and the left leaders, because they were all participating in the coup attempt, that they all would be executed was the first news. They were shocked, disbelief. There have been outcry all around the world. But the shock was given. And the shock eventually dissolved in a few days. Nothing was happening. But after a few days, suddenly there was a decision. Suddenly there was a verdict. And all the leaders, the former colleagues, the former comrades of these people, were executed in one go. In a matter of a few days, all the liberal leaders and the left leaders and the critics and writers who could be of any opposition to the Iranian authorities were simply executed. But before that, the grip of the power was established intact. Well, the world was short. There were reports. But when you have already spread a very harsh news, the, the primary shock was there already, and then nothing was happening, and it eventually dissolved down, diluted, and then a major action was following that. Many authorities who were dictatorial or totalitarian would try such things. We have a lot of examples. Let's take the case of uh, uh, Indonesia, when Sukarno was in power. Sukarno was a, a, a liberal person who was very close with the then, uh, I mean, comparatively progressive leaders all around the world, including Nasser and Jawaharlal Nehru and Josip Broz Tito. And Sukarno was a great friend of uh, the idea of secularizing the traditional societies. And there was a moment against that. This government was not liked by the left groups there. And they initiated a, a movement against the authorities. The then Soviet Union supported them. By the way, in Iran also, before the Islamic revolution, the struggle against the then monarch was supported by one side of the Cold War. Because it looked like it was a struggle against the Amer American presence in the area. The Cold War found its playground in Iran. Similarly, it found its another playground in Indonesia. Sukarno was ousted, and Suharto came to power. The same pattern you can see there. In some days, you found that the whole liberal and left groups who supported, who were on the side of the Soviet camp on the I mean, Cold War, they were kept out of power. Though the, the overthrow of the government was with their support, they were kept out of the power and the radical Islamic forces were encouraged. And in a few days, in an unexpected move, there was an announcement about a coup. All the critics of the Islamic government who were former colleagues of these people who came to power were all caught, arrested, and executed in one go. A large number of leaders. They were all wiped off. Nobody speaks about that. Now when Iran makes an announcement, first the parliament decides with a huge majority to do the, give the harshest punishment to all these imprisoned people. Then they immediately, a pesto, some five, six people are executed. There is not much sound. And then the fate of these people are there. You, you don't know what is going to happen to them. And the authorities are so sure that they want to win. But on the other side, the people who are struggling against the authorities are so sure that they are not going to cow down. You should also understand there's a long history of the struggle against hijab. The, it runs into, into several decades. We all know about uh, Masha Amini, Amini uh, who was I mean, actually wearing hijab, but the morality police 
who should control as per the law all those people who would be who would not, would not be wearing hijab and take them to a kind of a schooling to train them how to undergo or live under the islamic law and send back but they would not like this kind of behavior in fact masha amini had a hijab but a part of her hair was i mean out of the hijab and she was taken away and her family was crying and later when she dies the official announcement came that she died of a heart attack but the reports very clearly uh, that came out in, in in from the hospitals made it clear that she was beaten with the batons and her skull was broken and that is the, that's why she has been died so her death has triggered the then existing struggle against hijab and it's suddenly spread like a wildfire and if you know there are two different types of law in iran one is to control women and covering of their hair and the body and that you know this kind of laws existed in iran some 90 years back many of us think of think that i mean before the 1979 revolution things were all fine i mean we see a lot of pictures of uh, beaches where i mean women are lying with uh, sunbathing and i mean people are i mean in the streets with the, the dress they like so such things were existing for a, for a while but there was an effort long back from 1925 we can see that there have been an effort to suppress women to force them i mean to wear hijab or i mean completely body covering dresses and this was a, a kind of a way to control the society the resa shah who was in authority from 1925 to 1941 who he wanted to force women to remove their veil in public that was the big change after that he suggested he was influenced by kamal ataturk mustafa kamal pasha of turkey who made the first secular revolution in an islamic world during the first world war when turkey was the headquarters of the global islam mustafa kamal pasha who is later called kamal ataturk made an, a change of the government there was an uprising against the authorities the ottoman empire the capital of the ottoman empire was istanbul at that time and that was covering practically a major part of the globe the world war shrink the size of the ottoman empire and there been khilafat movement in many parts of the world especially in india for those people who were afraid that the authority of the islamic center would be challenged because turkey was against britain in the world war so the british authorities were attacked by the khilafat movement with an argument that they were fighting against their khalifa the global leader of the islam then islam had an international headquarters then in istanbul but that was in a way before turkey could be defeated there was an internal revolution in turkey a secular revolution that turned down everything the new leader gave liberty to women to wear whatever they want and they were modernized they they got modern education i mean it's a there's a sort of dramatic change that happened in turkey at that time which is known as the first secular revolution in the islamic world and the leader of iran raza shah who was in power from 1925 to 1941 which i said earlier was influenced by uh, mustafa kamal pasha or ataturk and he wanted the women to come out of all this compulsory hijab and veil and all these kind of things and he suggested women to be free take out all your veil but he made a, a legislation in 1936 and it's a kind of a movement not forcing veil but suggesting unveiling that was the revolution and that has been a big success Iranian women started getting the breath of liberty which they did not experience for a long time you have to know that i mean persian 
Iran, which was the early, early Persian Empire, has been a major center of culture and civilization. It's one of the oldest cultures in the world. Was, I mean, was the center of many religions. And the Saratoshtra religion was coming from there. And the, the, uh, they were all chased off when Islam came. Though there is a small community of uh, Sorastrians still there, majority of them left the country. And I mean, so it, it became a totally oppressive Islamic rule much later. And the whole Persian tradition on, and civilization of art and culture and music that was part of the celebrated life in Persia was all suppressed and it was overturned and Islamic rule completely shadowed the, the uprising of the civilization there. The change came first by Rasa Shah. Um, so in 19, uh, 1936, the first law came to unveil the, I mean, that women were suggested, encouraged to take off their hijab, take off their, their the black long clothes covering their whole body, and they were suggested, encouraged to go out and work, to go and study, to go to universities, and it was a big, big change. This positive move that again transformed the life of the Iranian women, in fact, is the foundation of the new struggle for liberty. So they had the lessons earlier, they had the experience earlier, how they could live a modern life, how they could live a life without the, the shadow of violent hijab. And uh, in, now this, uh, I mean, I don't go, want to go into the whole details of the whole thing, but this was uh, turned in 1979, totally, against the whole tradition that existed earlier. In 1979, after the Islamic revolution, once Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini took over the power, at that time there was no law that instructed women to wear, I mean, hats, even head scarves. They were free. A few days before the Islamic revolution, there are photographs available on the internet, you can see it. There were open beaches and women were in normal, uh, I mean, swimming dress and I mean, people were walking in the streets with the, either jeans or I mean, short skirts and everything was like in a normal modern world. But once the new law came in 1979, it, it introduced a hijab law. So on March 18th of 1979, once this law came, a lot of women came to the streets. That was the first powerful movement against the forced hijab. Thousands of women came out and they asked for choice in clothes. What we should wear is our choice. I mean, ironically, the same slogan you can hear from those people who advocate hijab in other countries, like in India, or many other countries where women are forced to wear hijab by families not by societies, but by communities and families where they are forced. They are forced by their family members to claim that it's our choice. In fact, the, to wear hijab or not would be our choice, not by the government's decision, was the slogan of the struggle against hijab in 1979. Once the law came, thousands and thousands of women went to the streets and marched protesting the idea of imposing hijab, 1979. So, but the law became obligatory. No amount of public protest, no amount of slogans, no amount of demonstrations changed the strict mindset of the religious authorities, who are now the political authorities also. They said in April, uh, I mean, it went on for some time. By April 1983, came the law that it's compulsory and it's legally obligatory that all women should have hijab when they go out. All women. If any foreigner who is a woman comes out of out to Iran, they are also forced to wear hijab. Any woman of any citizenship, you go to Iran, the moment you enter there, you have to wear 
a hijab. That's the new law that came in 1983. So since then, every single woman is obliged to wear hijab in public. Even non-Muslims, visiting journalists, visiting political leaders, everybody is forced, if they are a woman, to wear the hijab. And that's a very special and interesting law in Iran. Recently, if you remember, Christian Amanpuri, the very famous journalist of CNN, who has gone to Iran many times and interviewed many of the top leaders there. And she, though she doesn't approve the idea of hijab, she wore a hijab because she wanted to uh, interview people and she interviewed there. But recently, the president of Iran came to United Nations in New York. There was an interview fixed with Christian Amanpuri for CNN. But she decided, since it's not Iran, since she would not approve the idea of wearing hijab by force by anybody, she appeared for the interview without a hijab. But that was in New York. The two chairs, the cameras were ready, but the assistants informed the president that the interviewer does not have a hijab. He refused to come for the interview for CNN. Christian Amanpuri, you know what she did at that time? She published this photograph of she waiting and the empty chair in front because she would not wear a hijab to interview a president because that's a question of dignity of any woman to decide what she wants. And the law that is in Iran is not possible in other parts of the world. But now the law in Iran itself is being challenged. So 19... Uh, 83, when this law came, people started movement against that. There is a street in Iran, which is known as, in Persian language, Ingulab means revolution. The street of revolution, Ingulab Street. In fact, the word Ingulab is popular in, in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, everywhere, as a word for revolution, which comes from Persian and transformed to Urdu language, because Urdu is influenced, Urdu is practically Hindustani, the language of uh, earlier India, with Persian script. So the word came from Persian originally. So the Ingulab Street, where women have been uh, demonstrating against the imposition of hijab, uh, there have been movements and continuously there have been efforts and efforts to come out without hijab. And then they would be taken away, they would be punished, they would be sent for I mean, rehabilitation, all these kind of things, but women kept on pouring in, one by one by one. It continued and continued. By the way, the, 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 the mindset of Iran is not in support of the Islamic authorities. A recent survey has shown it very clear that the majority in Iran would prefer to leave even Islam if given an opportunity and if they were assured that they would not be executed. But there is no possibility. You know that most of the Iranians who live in London or in other parts of the world have left Islam. Majority of them, of course, there could be some people, but majority of them have left Islam. There is the, the Islamic authority in Iran is a minority government practically. Because there is no public sanction for this new constitution that came in Iran after the Islamic revolution. It was forced by authorities who were in power. It was an exclusive parliament that decided it. And to contest even the election, you have to support the ideas of the present constitution that insists on Islamic rule and accept the absolute authority of the, uh, the religious, supreme religious leader who could even take a decision against anything that is decided in the parliament or even overthrow an elected government. And he would be the absolute, absolute authority. And majority of the people do not accept this, but still they have to live there. There is no way, like in Afghanistan. We all know that why Afghanistan is under Taliban because they had weapons. 
the people there believed that those people who promised to protect them would remain there. There was no way. All those people could leave, left the place. And the rest of the people who are there have no choice. You question, you will be arrested and you'll be executed. You would not even face a normal trial. The local religious groups could make a, a decision and you could be hanged publicly or you would be executed or hanged and executed. You have seen that, I mean, many, many pictures are all around. Or if you make uh, anything that is against the decisions of the authorities, for example, women are not allowed to wear nail polish. I've seen a video which was disturbing for several nights for me, was a girl who has been wearing some nail polish was caught in some rural area and her hands were put on a, wood, a big wooden plank and with the rustic knife just simply chopped off. And so that it's not stitched or anything, it was put, pressed into burning tar. And that was the punishment. She lost her hand, but she's still lucky. She lost only her hand. Many people lose their head. People are beheaded, people are killed, people are hanged, people are shot dead. So you have no opportunity in an Islamic regime like that of Taliban to fight against that. You surrender, succumb and behave or you are eliminated. That's how Islamic rule in its classical form prevails. Iran, it has a little more sophisticated way of presentation. They have an elected parliament, but a parliament can decide anything. You know, what was the kind of report that was coming? Of course, this report is not based on fact. Now, we know nobody was executed in such mass levels. But we know that 15,300 girls are now in prison. The Iranian law, which gives death penalty by hanging to anybody except to a virgin. A virgin cannot be killed. That is the law. The report was so shocking. The report said that most of these women could be virgins. But they were in how, how would they identify the virginity? I mean, there is no way. But the report suggested as follows. First, there would be, there would be a decision to execute them. But then before the actual hanging, they would be raped by the, they would formally marriage by the jailers and they would be raped so that they are officially no more virgins. That would be within the frames of the law then to execute them. And that is, that is how the reports came first. Such stories are already available in many parts, in, in local communities where fidelity of somebody is doubted, people still don't go to court, but sometimes in many places, women are simply half buried and stoned to death in Iran. Many places, there are videos available everywhere. The laws officially execute people, but people take their laws in their hands and not people, but the local fanatic groups who think that they are implementing the laws of Allah. So the Iranian revolution now is happening. And you have to see, I mean, the kind of videos. I'm in constant contact with many of the people who are actively engaged in this struggle. People who are sitting in London and Canada and other places and who are in constant contact with those people who are in the forefront. They are trying to build a public opinion. They are trying to... Uh, awaken the global uh, attention to the whole thing. But the continuous effort, see 15,000 people are arrested now, but every single day there are thousands and thousands of people again on the streets. They're not going. Their position is very simple. We don't mind even being killed. We don't mind if you're tortured because we want freedom. The greatest value for them is freedom. The choice that they want to live the life the way they want. Otherwise, it's equal to death. Therefore, there are hundreds of them, thousands of them are again and again. No jail can fill them anymore. They're still 
pouring in any way. There are shootings on them, grenades on them. There are all kinds of torture or arrest or anything is possible, but still they are coming and coming in the streets. Women are cutting off their hair to symbolically show that this hair is no more a symbol of oppressing us. They're taking off their hijab and burning it publicly. And clerics who are wearing all these fine headgears, young boys are going and taking it off and laughing. No matter they would be killed, but they are showing their dissent, their unhappiness, their dislike against the authorities now. So the Iranian revolution for freedom has to win. It has to be successful. It should triumph over the authorities that are trying to press the people down. If a small minority of people who are fanatic, who are completely controlled by their belief in whatever old texts that, that they're believing in, against the wishes of people are controlling them. They're imposing their laws. They're imposing their values. They're imposing their way of understanding what life should be upon the people. So that's being challenged now. Now the simple question is what we can do to counter this. What, what I mean, we are at different places far off. All the people who are outside Iran, all the Iranians outside, most of them, majority of them, are actively organizing people, talking to media. You have to also understand that there is no internet anymore in most parts of Iran. You cannot communicate to them. But there are other ways to reach them. People use VP and people use uh, Tor and I mean a lot of other ways to overcome the methods and they have developed their own system to communicate. And still people are communicating. And for example, one good story that I read about the way how a demonstration has been mobilizing people. There is no internet, there is no mobile phone, nothing is working. But young women just write hundreds and hundreds of notes on little papers, suggesting that come to this place for the demonstration tomorrow at six o'clock, for example. So these small slips are dropped in homes. Hundreds of women go out and drop in hundreds of houses and people read these slips and they go out. This moment finds its own ways to reach out people. Mouth to mouth, small paper sheets to paper sheets, they communicate to people and it spread everywhere in Iran. It started in a Kurdish area. Now it's everywhere in Iran, everywhere in Iran. And this has only, I mean, one solution. Either the authorities should brutally suppress it, it should not happen. And that should be the end of the Iran regime if they do it. But they should not do it. And instead, there shall be a democratic solution. There shall be a democratic revolution happening. There shall be a secular election happening. There shall be an open system coming up there and women are liberated. And they should be allowed. They should, they should have their permission to do whatever they want, whatever dress they want, whether veil or not, or jeans or, I mean, uh, whatever they want, I mean, they should be able to wear. So now it's not a question of hijab or not. It's a question of whether you want to live under the Islamic regime or not. That's the issue now. The fight is no more for way. The fight is no more for your hair. The fight is now for democracy, for a civilized world, for a new democratic system. If that has to be successful, if that moment should win, we will have to do something. That's what I wanted to suggest in this meeting. Every one of us, everybody who would understand the importance of the struggle, we all have to be involved in our simple ways. Get in all information, First hand information, don't spread any rumors, get the correct information from authentic sources and communicate it with social media. That's one of the first things that all of you can do. 
all those people who are active on the social media requested to make at least three or posts every week reporting what is happening in Iran and telling people what is the latest stage of affairs. Spread the message, reach out people. The most powerful means to reach people at this moment is social media, but not only limited to social media. If you know a journalist, if you know a television channel, if you know a newspaper, if you know a, a, a writer, ask them to write something. Suggest them that you would like to hear about what was happening in Iran, and you would like to get the opinion of people speaking for them. If you know a writer, if you know anybody who can influence society, if you know a, a, a person who can influence the public opinion, talk to them. Encourage them to write and report about Iran. Because at this moment, the biggest thing that's happening in this world is the revolution for freedom in Iran. We all have to be involved in our limited ways. Communicate, talk, make whatever communication possible through internet or articles or whatever tools or whatever it's possible, reach out people, communicate, and identify those groups whom you can support. The very important groups who are working for them. For example, Amnesty International is very actively involved in the rights of people there. If you can support Amnesty International, there are many other groups, very uh, respected and uh, very seriously coordinated groups are there. There are five or six internationally recognized groups are there. And uh, these organizations are seeking support. They, they have published a lot of toolkits, how you can help them. Starting from giving a small donation, maybe a, a small amount, five euros or five dollars or 100 rupees, give a small donation to Amnesty International for this cause so that the message is reaching people. If you try to get pamphlets and leaflets, which are abundantly available on, online, you can just download and print out, give to people, forward it to people, write to people. That's important because every single public opinion is important now. Every piece of information is opinion, important now. If you find anything that is going against freedom, against what's happening in Iran, against the, the, the struggle of people for liberty, counter it peacefully, not with anger. Don't try to humiliate your opponents. If you try to humiliate your opponents, that only show that you are weak if you can peacefully and powerfully communicate with the facts and documents, and if possible with pictures and correct misinformation. That's one important thing that you can do. Even if the mainstream media does not speak about anything, there should be a big network of communication that's reaching out people. So there are, Iranian groups in different cities. If you know any of these groups, I will later publish a list of groups who are actively involved in London, in Canada. I mean, there are so many groups who are very, very active. Give them strength. There are toolkits published how to, how to reach out people. Primarily, reaching out with information, that's the most, most important thing. Then influencing the opinion makers, influencing them to speak out. All these reluctant people should be encouraged to speak out. There is nothing to be afraid of, rather that they would be doing a noble thing to fight for the liberty, the biggest struggle that happens in this century. Iranian revolution, the new Iranian revolution that's happening now should change a new direction to the world. It should set new standards how the influence of the fanatic and extremist forces are overturned. So therefore, the people who are struggling there 
need our support. And all those international groups like Amnesty International or World, there, there are so many groups. I mean, I would re- later publish on the rationalist websites, the major groups that are involved. Get authentic information, first-hand information, and, and the toolkits have to be used to reach out people. And that's the first thing. And if you can donate some money to Amnesty or any other group that's actively reaching out people, do that. If you are in a country where you can talk to your politicians, your decision makers, talk to them, say your opinion. Most of the politicians would move only when they know that the people whom they rely upon for votes are with a clear opinion. Talk to them and talk to the media. And you yourself, in the possible way, become a part of this communication process. That's the only thing that we can do from a far off place away from Iran. But every single thing that we do would have an impact. The world public opinion would really matter. That's so important and so decisive that every single person who is involved, who who wants to change Iran, should get into some kind of an action, a piece of writing, at least a good post that you see about Iran, please forward it, communicate to people. That's what you can do. So what I precisely want to say is that there is an updating uh, available in different sources. This all will be updated on the Rationalist app. If you do not know about the Rationalist app now, I mean, this is a new development. We have developed a new application which is downloadable on your Apple phone as well as Android phone, free of cost, no advertisements. There is nothing obligatory. You can become a basic member of the National International, which costs nothing. Of course, there are other levels of membership which needs other things, but a basic membership is absolutely free of cost. But once you are in, you keep on getting information every day on your phone. So you would get links to get first-hand information, reliable information, but not only on Iran, but also on other parts of the world, what is happening, which you don't normally reach in the mainstream media. That's one source, but there are other sources also, but get the reliable information, get involved, try to do whatever you can. It's not a question of spending any money, it's spending at least 15 minutes for a great cause every day, if possible, because We need change and we need change in Iran. A change in Iran would be a triggering of bigger changes to come in the future. Thank you very much. I think uh, actually that 50,000 girls are in their danger, right? Yes, their lives are in danger. I mean, anything could happen. Many of them probably would be eliminated is what I'm afraid of. This is my... uh, Everybody's duty to do maximum to the cause of the land. If anybody who is in the meeting would like to contribute something, make an opinion or some questions, whatever it is, they are all welcome. Practically, and they have to raise their hand. Matumatu, you are also a moderator now, so that you can handle the uh, the questions and the comments, probably. Yeah. Anybody who have any questions or any opinion, you can come forward, please. I think Michael has to say something. The presentation is very touching, and sometimes you are uh, uh, your silence. I can understand. Well, that's a question. I'll translate the question for those who do not understand Malayalam. The question is, 15,000 people now in jail, will they take such a suicidal step, such a, an absurd step, for, step of executing all these people, which might turn the whole world against them? That's the question. 
But you know, uh, the totalitarian authorities would not mind to do anything. You have, you have seen what was done by Pol Pot. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people were simply executed in, in a few days. I mean, of course, I mean, there'll be huge public outcry, but uh, a ruthless authority can do anything that, but for, for that, we have to ensure that there is enough public pressure all around the world against such a move. When this report came, CNN and BBC and I mean, head of nations and everybody responded. Of course, I mean, the news was not confirmed. I mean, but there was one decision by the parliament that the government was given full authority to do the harshest, to give the harshest punishment if they want, which would open, which could open a gateway to do anything. In my opinion, I mean, as I rightly said, I mean, uh, this could be a test close to see what extent the world reaction would be, would go. So now they know, I mean, what, what, what would be the public response? You know it. And beyond that, there is nothing to happen. That's the whole problem. Because governments with a ruthless authoritarian mindset could go to any extent. And, and Iran has a lot of pressure things in their hand. They have petroleum with them. In many countries, they think they would be able to pressurize with their might of petroleum power. And I mean, of course, I mean, even if there are international sanctions against Iran, they still survive because of, I mean, their manipulations of, uh, uh, of international sale of petroleum. I mean, of course, I mean, these things are very difficult to handle, but the pressure of international public opinion would be one only deterrent, one only way to stop them. There is no other way. They could go anyway. I mean, there are examples. Indonesia, it has happened. Even in Iran, it has happened. If you remember Germany during Hitler's rise, you know, the famous story that there was an accusation that somebody has tried to burn the parliament building a crazy guy who tried to put in some fire on a window or something like that was caught. And the immediate accusation was there was an effort to burn the parliament and the public opinion was built up immediately. And several hundreds of thousands of people were rounded up and executed after that. And the whole, uh, the political critics of Hitler were wiped off with that or arrested or eliminated. So such things are possible by brutal authorities. So therefore, in a modern world, we should do everything possible that they cannot go to that extent. I have another opinion, uh, Yes. Uh, actually, the government don't want to uh, defeat themselves because uh, if they uh, defeated by this uh, uh, this mask, they are going to be in a uh, big problem. No, even the mask will kill them on the roads, uh, uh, roadside, right? It all depends, you know. So the, they will go to any extent. They could go to any extent because I mean, what we have seen in Afghanistan, for example, every, every opposition is silenced, everything is stopped, everything is suppressed now. Nobody wants to speak out. There is no choice. The moment you speak out, you are finished. And I'll tell you another example. Today in this meeting, I discussed with the one Iranian activist to participate. In fact, the person, uh, a girl, I mean, uh, she was in Delhi. When I, I, when I was in Delhi, when I was the president of the International Center for Kathakali, this girl came to the Kathakali Center with an application to study Kathakali, an Iranian girl, where dance is a sin, where music is a sin. This girl came to Delhi to study, but she wanted to dance and study. She was studying Paritanatyam and she came to Kathakali Center. I immediately, though the admissions were over at that year, I mean, I've taken the initiative to give, give her admissions. And uh, she became a great Kathakali artist and she performed there. And uh, she now is living in Canada and actively involved in coordinating the activities outside. And uh, she originally agreed to participate in this meeting and talk to all of you. Another day she would come also, but today, there was something that has been worrying her. Her husband, 
who is also supporting her, had a concern because her father still lives in Iran. Some of the family members are still living in Iran. If she comes out and if her identity is clearly exposed to them, what they were afraid was the life of their relatives in the country. Some of the friends are already in the jail. This is the risk that these people all are having. I know a lot of other people who are actively working for the rights of Iranian women. The Maryam Namasi, for example. Maryam Namasi was a, an Iranian student who was living in Agra as a student when the Iranian revolution happened. And she later went to London and she is leading the ex-Muslim movement in London. Maryam Namazi is actively participating in and organizing huge demonstrations and public meetings in London. She's from Iran. She's an honorary associate of our Rationalist International. But uh, she's one of the outspoken persons who is already in public. But many people who are actually in public domain are afraid to identify fully. So this is one risk that many of these Iranian students are facing or Iran, Iranian activists who are living outside are facing because some of their relatives are still in the country. To what extent these authorities would go to suppress the struggle? It's not very clear at this moment. So it's, it's a question of life and death. It's a question of your survival or your continuance. It's a question of victory or getting killed. It's a question of freedom or total surrender. See, there is, a, there is no choice. You have to decide. Is not seen. Ahmad, you can ask. Ahmad. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, about Iran, we can uh, enough, uh, America have enough uh, power to stop the uh, program of Iran. Uh, now you know, we know Iran have uh, strong weapons. We can stop Iran. I think the America now is support the revolution in Iran. But can you identify where are you calling from? I am from Sudan. From Sudan. Okay. Now the question is very simple. Uh, you know, United States or America, as well as UK, and many of the, I mean, European Union countries have enough power if they want to counter Iran. But there's an international order. You cannot simply attack a country because there are certain international laws. Unless and until they violate all basic laws of United Nations and uh, the international system or, or balance of power, you cannot directly interfere into the internal affairs of a country. For example, we all know that uh, in North Korea, there are a lot of things that, ha that are happening against the, the, our present knowledge of human rights, but you cannot directly interfere for two reasons. Number one, you have to uh, follow certain international laws, number one. Number two, one should not trigger off a great global war. Iran, I mean, though Iran is claiming that they do not have nuclear power, it's doubted, it's suspected that they have nuclear power. So if an international power directly interferes into Iran, that will immediately take into a new direction. That would give an, you know, immediately the, the equations internationally would change. Any country, for example, if United States directly intervene in the affairs of Iran, that may be, I mean, condemned by other, other forces which have political interests against the United States. So these things are not that easy to interfere into one country unless there is a collective consensus from the global powers. Even when there is collective consensus by the global powers, sometimes it may not work, it may not be successful because fighting on terrains in a, on a different level where there are uh, I mean, possibilities of a long-term war cannot sometimes be that easy. See the case of Ukraine. We all know that there is an aggression against Ukraine and there is no way of justification of what's happening in Ukraine and the whole world is condemning that but all the same, you cannot go and fight for Ukraine there. You cannot go and put into the, your army there. You can support with money, with weapons. That's a limitation. In Iran, 
Of course, the whole struggle is supported by the liberal forces all around the world. All the international NGOs are supporting them. There are funds provided to them. There are international communication ways. For example, internet is closed, but satellite nets are working, providing them way of communication. A parallel communication system is established by satellites. So these all are very powerful measures that are taken. How these people are communicating with each other, not only by slips. Of course, I slips, the story of the slips being circulated is one way of communication, which is a dramatic story that they have been doing. But all the same, they're using satellite communication. And that's provided by satellites. And that's controlled by the international political powers. So it's supported. But the struggle has to be taken forward by the forces within. The people have to struggle. It can only be supported from outside. One cannot interfere there. Then that's a different political course. That's the limitation. Any other question, Ahmed? No, 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 no. Thank, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you. That. Uh, I think, uh, uh, Kunjabha, Kunjabha, uh, do you have any questions? Uh, I don't have questions. Uh, I appreciate the presentation very much. I don't know what can do anybody in this struggle because their, uh, you know, that the Quran says women to wear hijab and wear in a certain way. That cannot be abolished that easy, you know. So what their authorities decide, uh, I don't know that's going to happen. It's only feel pain for the woman. That's all I can say. And I don't think uh, America or India or anyone else is coming forward. I think Iran is in friendship with Russia. Russia may not say anything. I don't know. It's very sad. I don't know what is going to happen. Thank you. Yeah, that's the, that, see, I mean, that's a very, very sad situation. For example, we all know that Taliban, I mean, how did they get the weapons in the last minute to overthrow the, I mean, when Americans were leaving or they decided to go, how did they get weapons to that extent, that fast? It's very clearly now known that before the declaration of the capture of power by Taliban in Afghanistan, the leaders have been in Beijing talking to Chinese authorities and they go to Chinese weapons very clearly. But all these countries have their own interests, their own, you know, geopolitical interests, their own economic interests, and they are guided by that. But that's why I say that I mean, beyond these political authorities, there should be international public opinions, opinion building up, and international NGOs coming up, and media coming up, and that should pressurize the whole situation. That's the only way to counter this political action, which would, would be possible only in extreme cases. Pol Pot is the best example. When thousands and thousands of people were killed, it took a long time. Nobody could do anything. Pol Pot died a natural death. And even Hitler, when the Holocaust was happening and where all this violence against the Jews were happening, and when he was expanding his borders for many years, the international powers did not want to interfere because that would escalate the war scheme. And the war is catastrophe, and that's more violence. So. Political powers are always careful about the consequences. So the Iranian situation has to be handled by people from within and with support uh, from outside and strengthening them would be the solution. It's a hard road, but that's the only way to fight against that. Uh, I have, uh, I have, uh, there is a misinformation going on here in Kerala uh, by the Islamists in Kerala. That is uh, the revolution. It is not the revolution against the Burka or this idea, but it is the revolution uh, going on there by Kurds. Kurds are doing this all things. This is the uh, information uh, uh, carried by these Islamists uh, uh, to the Islamic uh, people here in Kerala. I, uh, I am a little afraid about it. Yeah, the, uh, the Kurdistan movement, you know, that's a kind of a dissent. I mean, Kurdish area is scattered in present day Syria, Iraq, and Iran. That's an old, uh, I mean, a political structure, which is no more existing, but there is a pan-Kurdistan movement, which is asking for Kurdish nationality and Kurdish identity. The, the struggle began in the present day broad Kurdistan area, but now it's in Tehran, the capital of Iran. It was 
sidelined by many people telling that come on this is a kurdish movement or something like that but it's not no more a, it's not a kurdish movement it's a struggle that's happening in the capital of iran and in every single city everywhere in iran and you know if when 15000 women from all across the country are in jail and the tehran jails are completely full and if the university students are coming out from every single university that means something it's no more it's not a kurdish moment the Kur that was one triggering point of course uh, the, the kurdish nationalism was an initial point of triggering but this is a freedom struggle for liberty and for democracy and for the dignity of the individual thank you sir sir we don't uh, please here yeah, sir i just want to add i mean uh, you talked about kurd uh, 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 if uh, somebody is telling it's a kurdish problem um uh, major 98% of the kurdish are identified themselves as sunni muslims and uh, iran is controlled by the shia and if the kerala people majority of the kerala muslims are uh, sunni muslims so uh, what kind of this one to uh, adding to that point uh, the international community the limitation of international community to intervene into the any some other countries problem the best example being uh, the north korea as a person traveled in north korea i know that uh, the many uh, the human that absolutely zero human rights but still uh, the international community is not able to interfere in the uh, uh, north korean issue uh, three generations uh, it, it ruled by the dictators and there's no solution billions just want to add that that's yeah right. absolutely absolutely i fully agree with what you said you know that's one right example north korea you cannot interfere i mean nobody wants to you know escalate a conflict that can go into a new world war because other political interests other international interests would immediately come into the scene and that can escalate therefore uh, it's and also no other country can interfere into a country what we can do would be supporting the struggle in and giving them strength that's the only practical way to counter i mean the the authoritarian structure of course the 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 elements of um, uh, other conflicts like nationalism i mean of course all these kind of things kurdish nationalism or other nationalism or shia sunni sunni conflict or many things can be adding factors but at the end of the day if anybody demands freedom asks for freedom for right and dignity that is not 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 to be seen from by whom it's such if it's by kurdish people or if it's by the uh, people who are living in tehran or if the saratustrans are speaking or whatever it is that's all the the call for freedom the rights liberty and dignity so i mean in any case i mean it's no more a kurdish struggle all facts are coming out i mean everywhere the struggle is there no single city in iran Uh, where you cannot see the presence of the struggle now everywhere everywhere this this struggle so it has to win it will win if not tomorrow but in the near future for sure i think no more questions uh, from uh, the yeah i think i mean there is uh, i mean not really much to ask and answer but if anybody want anybody wants to contribute something add something they are all welcome but i would suggest as follows please download the application rationalist and follow uh, what is happening get the first hand information try to use use your social media to reach out to people counter counter any kind of misinformation with facts and evidences and reach out to people reach out opinion makers reach out politicians and support the international ngos these are the only things that we can do at this moment but i will certainly bring in to talk to you some of the actual leaders of this movement in one of the coming meetings who are the brains behind this movement who are sitting in london sitting in canada how they are operating they will come and explain to you in one of the future meetings thank you very much <laughs>